you look at a locust, a locust is an eating machine. It's a remarkable organism. It forms some of the largest groups in nature. They eat their own weight and food, so they're extremely voracious. The desert locust invasion, uh, it's the worst that we've seen in Kenya over 70 years. Huge swarms of desert locusts have invaded the Horn of Africa and parts of India and the Middle East, devouring everything in their path. Some say it's biblical. There are over 30 mentions of locusts in the Bible. Thousands of years ago, people responded to locusts by lighting fires, you know, banging pots and pans, uh, praying, and even now we are responding this way because it is a very terrifying thing to see millions, billions of insects descending from the sky. Typically, desert locusts can be found in 30 countries from Africa to Asia. The desert locust is a very widespread species that occurs in the Sahel, in parts of the Horn of Africa, in the Middle East, all the way into Asia. But when the monsoons come, Vegetation grows lush, inviting an army of hungry locusts who could cover as much as 30 million square kilometers, three times the area of Europe or Canada. Over the last two years, the current outbreak that we see in East Africa and actually across Asia has been built up due to increased numbers of cyclones rolling in off the Indian Ocean to make landfall either on the uh, Horn of Africa or across the Arabian Peninsula. The swarms are so large, they've even been detected on radar. The vegetation in northern Kenya has been at the highest level in 30 years. Perfect breeding opportunities for the locusts. If this upsurge is not brought under control, it could become a plague and the region will suffer the worst food crisis in their lifetime. The swarms are mainly in East Africa and they're along both sides of the India-Pakistan border. They've been in southern Iran and southwestern Pakistan. These, the swarms um, so far have caused substantial damage in, in all of the countries, mainly against crops that are already planted. And there are other countries at risk. These are some of the most vulnerable countries to drought and poverty. A swarm of this magnitude could wipe out entire communities. It turns out the locusts seem to do a remarkable job of landing in locations where there's an intersection of ideal conditions locally due to climate change and the worst conditions possible due to local conflict. In fact, the source of the current crisis originated in a conflict zone where it couldn't be contained. There is a substantial number of swarms that formed in Yemen because of the conflict there. Uh, they're unable to be controlled or even detected. Desert locusts are the most destructive migratory species in the world. We know that these locusts, the locusts that we see here, can create really massive uh, devastation, not only in terms of crop, but also in terms of pasture, and therefore affecting the livelihoods of the pastoralist communities. A single locust is two grams in weight, and can eat her own weight and food every day. So a swarm of 40 or 50 billion individuals can eat as much food in a single day as the entire country of Kenya. We expect that the impact that it will have on food security and agricultural livelihoods, both for the farmers and for the pastoralists, can be significant. When you have locusts come into these areas and, and they simply just you know, eat um, the majority of these crops, if not all of these crops, it has you know, a terrible impact on, on, you know, on families, on, on communities, on their livelihoods. A locust plague can devastate 20% of the Earth's landmass, affecting 10% of the entire world population, and further destabilize those in conflict zones. 
Ironically though, for the rest of the animal kingdom, a locust swarm is an edible dream come true. If we think of a swarm of locusts, we look at it right now as a problem, but other creatures in the landscape look at it as an opportunity, which it is. Locusts are extremely nutritious. When we had swarms of locusts come through Impala, you could almost hear the birds and other animals celebrating from a distance because they were seeing it as a source of nutrition. In the field, control operations remain a huge challenge as dozens of countries are desperately trying to prepare for and protect from the next wave. Locust infestation is happening in a very wide area and you find that every time you are trying to control in one region, there is another swarm that is happening in a different region and it is not possible to control them simultaneously. The Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO's Desert Locust Information Service, tracks locusts and weather conditions to provide early warning to those affected by swarms. Partnering with Penn State and Plant Village, they're developing new tools like eLocust 3M to collect critical data in real time. eLocust 3M is a remarkably simple app that allows individuals to record the presence of locusts in their environment, take a picture, and all of that is shared in the cloud for researchers to use and to predict the, the occurrence of locusts in the coming days. The wide reach of eLocust 3M has been incredibly valuable for those affected, as well as the research community. We've been able to go from semi-nomadic pastoralists in northern Kenya all the way through to groups of scientists working collaboratively in a cloud system via NASA and NOAA, and everybody in between. The more people feeding into the system, the better the system gets. With the ability for, for people to use cell phones and to be able to transmit these data and to use social media gives completely new opportunities to have so sort of real-time forecasting, real-time knowledge for which you can use for forecasting, for which you can, you can gather data. So all of these different approaches, I think, synergize together. FAO combines this data with weather prediction and tracking tools from NASA and NOAA to help fight the invasion. We're using satellites to detect rainfall, green vegetation, soil moisture in the desert. To, to help you know, prioritize those, those surveys and those control operations. We want to know where they are and we want to know when they were present. And then we want to enable ground teams and aerial teams to spray them and control them. The main strategies for controlling locusts are currently using pesticides that are delivered in several different ways. Aerial spraying has been the main way that locusts have been controlled. They're fighting locusts at different stages. Flying adults in the air and young wingless hoppers on the ground. What we saw here this morning is upper bands, so they are not flying yet. For that, we can do a ground control operations. So there is a, a variety of tools that we have at our disposal but there's a price to pay using pesticides. Pesticides are poisons, they are toxic, and they do have effects on other creatures. And because of the spraying in those local areas, they are, there are effects on bees and birds that uh, are very serious. And we do need to figure out better ways of applying and managing pesticides. Including new, safer biopesticides. A biopesticide is, is the fungus that infects the desert locust, on, only locusts. It doesn't infect any other animals. It's very safe for the environment and very effective. Fighting a plague during a global pandemic is a nightmare. The current COVID-19 pandemic, combined with the outbreak of locusts, has been devastating for many communities and for farmers in particular, which has made it harder to obtain the chemicals and equipment. It is making it harder for people to move around. If you'd spoken to any good entomologist or evolutionary biologist, they would have told you that this was long overdue. 
The locust crisis in the Horn of Africa this year came at the same time floods did, and then the intersection of COVID-19. All of this have, have moved a group of individuals who were already on the, the knife edge of poverty over the edge. With two disasters occurring simultaneously in this region, many are in a near impossible situation. If we are not able to control locust population for the moment, there will be a huge impact on the forthcoming planting season. I think, unfortunately, because of other things going on in the world, people are forgetting, you know, the problem with the locusts. We didn't believe it ourselves, especially after a problem like the coronavirus. How, how are we going to feed Kenya? The desert locust both fascinates and challenges the science community which we have been terrified by, by for thousands of years, have also been a great source of interest to scientists for many, many decades, for over a hundred years. Even biblical references are considered valuable information. A lot of good biology is observed in the, in the biblical times, including how the locusts moved into and out of Egypt. The Mpala Research Center in Kenya, partnered with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Smithsonian Institute, are studying the ecology of this enigmatic creature. One of the remarkable things about the desert locust is that it appears to have a very large genome. Its genome is more than twice the size of the human genome. So we're now working to sequence the genome of the desert locust and really understand how does its genetics and its adaptation impact its biology and are there solutions that we could potentially come up with based on that understanding. Put him on there, center him. The amazing things about locusts is how they can switch on and switch off different genes depending on how they live. So there's this amazing Jekyll and Hyde situation that occurs with locusts. At the Max Planck Institute in Germany, scientist Ian Kozin and his team use AI and VR to simulate swarms. We have uh, an, an ability to put locusts into a fully immersive virtual environment. So they're interacting with virtual locusts in full 3D space. It's like interacting with holograms in their environment. This gives us a much better ability to understand what's going on in the brain of the individual locust in the context of the swarm. In this case, we're controlling the swarm. Understanding the collective behavior of a swarm is the key. And so that's the ultimate goal, is to be able to develop behavioral models that allow us to better predict where and when swarms form in the field. This cutting edge research brought about a major unexpected discovery about how and why desert locusts swarm. They're all marching in unison in the environment, but in actual fact, they're, they're cannibals. Each individual is trying to cannibalize those ahead and trying to avoid being cannibalized by those behind. You know, when times get hard and individuals can't get the nutrition they need, what's better than a perfectly packaged source of all of the minerals and nutrients and protein and salt you need as a locust is in another locust. They start to aggregate together on these essential resources. They change their biology, they start forming swarms. The locust is an eating machine and all they do when they're not resting or breeding is they eat. And now instead of avoiding each other, they actually tend to be attracted to each other. They tend to cannibalize each other and they tend to swarm together in these environments. This research will continue, but right now, the priority is to stay one step ahead of the swarm. Accurate wind and weather prediction is the key.
Swarms basically travel with the wind. They, they travel about 150 kilometers a day. They move with the prevailing wind. And so understanding which direction the winds are blowing is critical to understanding where are we going to find them tomorrow, next week. Using the wind models, we can predict where they're going to move afterwards. If we, you know, could improve somehow the, the forecasting of, of cyclones several months in advance, even longer, that would be ideal. So if we had early warning of that, then all the countries could benefit. FAO is even trying to hack satellite technology from NOAA that detects smoke plumes to track swarms. What the community is doing is using a model that has been designed to find contaminants in a city, for example, a, an explosion at a chemical plant or the plume of a volcano. And it's a dispersion model that looks at how things move in the wind. If the current trend of wet weather continues, the swarms will increase and spread throughout the region. The swarms will be moving north into Sudan, Ethiopia, move across the Indian Ocean to, to India and Pakistan. Swarms in southern Iran have um, already moved to, to that common border in India and Pakistan. Breeding is underway along both sides of the Indo-Pakistan border. While the situation has improved in Iran, Yemen continues to be a cause of concern because of the continuation of rains and the lack of mitigation, threatening to further destabilize millions living in poverty and conflict zones. There will be a new, uh, a new generation of locusts that is going to come and that will coincide with more or less the time of the, of the planting season. There will be a challenge in terms of availability of various foods in the future, given that if the locust investigation continue without being controlled, it is going to impact a lot in the availability of food. All of our produce is, is for local consumption. I think everyone needs to take this seriously and support, support everywhere you can, because it, it's a very big problem. We've had plagues in the past that have lasted many, many years and this can also be a future scenario that we have to consider. These are creatures that are not going away. They're going to be around. They've been around for millions of years. We will need to figure out how to live with them.